Welcome everybody to B2B Talks 4, where B2B doesn't necessarily mean boring to boring. That's your cue, guys. You're supposed to say, yeah. <laughs> Next sponsors will have to bring vodka instead of beers. Uh, welcome, everyone. <laughs> welcome, everyone. My name is Kfil Pravda. I'm the CEO of Pravda Media Group. Uh, we are uh, the hosts of this event. Um, B2B Talks is a community of B2B marketers who sell mainly technology products to the international markets. Uh, we're doing this event in English because many of you guys are uh, fluent uh, uh, English speakers and because one of the things we saw there are so many events for Israelis that are uh, that are doing marketing but not enough for expats or people who came to Israel and are uh, the backbone of this industry at the end of the day uh, this vi this event is going to be uh, recorded is recorded on video hopefully Oi, everything is okay with the camera good so this event is actually being recorded on video uh, and will be uploaded uh, later on to our website and I promise personally that we will edit the videos this time, okay? We have some backlog there. Um, first of all, I'm here with our uh, awesome team. Uh, all the guys from, and girls, from Pravda Media Group, please raise your hands. Please raise your hands. If you need anything during the event, if your glass is not full, if you uh, wanna ask questions, if you want to ask questions to the panel, just go to the uh, Pravda Media Group representative next to you and ask them, and they will know how to wave to me in different ways. Investment. You did investment yeah. in Pravda Media Group? We didn't, but we can talk afterwards. That's perfectly okay. I'm here with an amazing uh, group of panelists. Roy Mann, the CEO of The Pools. <laughs> Ramel Levine, VP Marketing of Cloud Indoor. And Moshe Milman, VP Operations of Apply Tools. <laughs> How many of you is their first event here? Whoa, that's awesome. That's good, good. Okay, so just important point for you to know, this is not a conference, okay? Uh, you do not need to be polite. The idea is that we ask questions and we help each other to, to face all the challenges that we have in our uh, ongoing work, meaning that uh, you are encouraged to ask questions. If you think any of the panelists, put aside me, is saying something completely wrong, raise your hand and say, no, it works completely different in a different way and so on, okay? This is a discussion, this is not, uh, we are not with suit and ties for a reason. Okay, or name, tags. or name tags, we will we'll take care of that next time, okay? Um, one last thing, um, the beer you're drinking is being sponsored by Bright Info. Woo! <laughs> is Boaz here? I don't see him. Maybe he went out. Well, okay, so he lost his cue. Can you call him for a second? Bright Info is a company which is uh, a partner of Pavda Media Group, and they were very, very gracious to uh, offer their sponsorship. Um, it's important to know. And this is also Mark Lerner, who's trying to sell to Bright Info his product. He's from Octopost. Um, Boaz, we just want to thank you for the beer. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> make a dent in the universe. Um, just for you to know, all the money, all the sponsorship money goes directly to your beers, meaning he's paying to the bar, okay? Um, as we said, it's an... an um, a community event. Okay, so let's start with the real thing. Let's start first of all with uh, you guys telling a bit more about what your companies do, okay? And what is your biggest lead gen challenge? So I'll, I'll tell you a bit about the history of the Pulse. We started uh, off as an internal project at Wix and we wanted to make sure that uh, every employee, I worked at Wix and we wanted to have everyone work uh, towards the same goal. Like our product is a, a, a management product that lets you uh, manage your team uh, towards the same goal and essentially have everything that you need to uh, manage uh, uh, your startup and create uh, transparency around what you do, like product process or or sales channel, like connect everyone in the in the company towards the same uh, objective. 
and it's uh, best seen visually. Like if you go to thepost.com, you'll see like an image of the product, and that's uh, important to our lead generation because uh, when people see how it looks, like it's a really nice uh, grid of colors that show you exactly where things are at. Like this is what sells us. So, so that's basically what we found. Like this is our product market fit. We started uh, for the last year and a half. Uh, or so for the last two years and uh, then the timeline is uh, like for the last two years we've been working on the product but for the last six months we've been started to sell uh, and and market it intensively so uh, so the one and a half years it took us to create that product market fit and when we when we did we felt it uh, uh, we felt that users want, like uh, uh, managers, product managers, and what have you, really want the that flashing dashboard that they can s look at their company and say, like, wow, I know wh where things are at, where it's blocked, it's very visual. And we market it on, uh, we started doing it on Facebook, because uh, we found that uh, on uh, Google, let's say, like how many of you would know what to search to find such a product? Like, would you do it? You go to usually to Excel. You try to find solutions that you already have to solve that problem. So what we found is that we need to uh, to address the people when they uh, uh, and and let them know that we exist. And Facebook is a good time because. Obviously, people surf on Facebook when they want to waste time and read stuff that will make them smarter. So, so that's like the the right. Or or you just like happen to ha need something like do a Google Ads and then you happen to read the wall for an hour. It doesn't matter for us. So, uh, so we started go doing uh, Google Ad campaigns and got a lot of traction, like lots of leads that signed up to the product. And we try to do let's. Uh, uh, all the uh, content stuff that uh, uh, gated content and sign up to a newsletter and whatever but we found that for us specifically uh, and I do think it's it's important that it's it's for our products sp specifically it was easier for us to get them to sign up so like to give their email and give the product a try and if they even uh, many of them just like said okay I'll, I'll give it a try then forgot it like five minutes later so it's it's a lead the people that sign up and not like a, an end process or something. And then we start uh, marketing to them uh, after they sign up. And uh, we have what you call a low touch sales model where we just, we get a, an inbound and we uh, touch them a little bit, like tell them, talk with them, show them uh, how the product fits what they need. Because the UI is very simple, the product itself is very simple, but people need to uh, understand how it relates to them, it's a process. The friction is not in the product, it's it's uh, in the people, in the process, how they introduce it to the company and things like that. So we found that we need to touch them a little bit. And uh, it also happens to, like, let me know if I'm... Uh, no, okay. Okay. We can okay. We have the present delay, it's okay. Okay. So uh, we started off using a, a CRM that we, we track all the different stages, but then we found, now currently, that we found that it doesn't really help us follow up on users the whole way. We just need to touch them and check later because we get a lot of inbound from the marketing and we, we really need to touch them a little bit and then they like go ahead. Uh, uh, so I if you like what I can contribute is how to measure that, like where do we start calling them? How do I know that our uh, customer success sales team need to grow? Like, uh, what are the leads that we are uh, uh, losing because we don't contact them? And what do you need to do? Like, uh, where where does the line fall between people that you don't need to contact and let them like do it themselves, like zero touch, and the one that touch? And I can tell you that in the future we're planning to go uh, higher up to uh, uh, bigger companies, and then we'll require more and more touch. But we intend to keep the low touch model as well. So we, we're going to split it because because the low uh, uh, the lower market, the mid lower market has is is bigger. So we want to keep that, and also in parallel move up. But but we're not moving up currently. Okay. 
So I'm coming from Apply Tools. It's a company that provides solutions for developers who are developing mobile and uh, mobile applications and websites, which allows them to make sure that the application look well on all different platforms, devices, operating systems, in a very easy way. You can, like, in minutes, build a test, which allows you to make sure that it looks right on all the different platforms. In the same way that a user looks at the uh, interface, we have some visual uh, analysis algorithms which can look on a screen and make sure that the screen looks well, starting from the layout, ranging to the content, and all the way. Uh, uh, to the data and uh, from a marketing perspective we started with b building like a, uh, a blog and okay we started with uh, a blog where we distributed some relevant content uh, uh, to a, a general content about uh, uh, not, not about our product but about the, uh, the industry we started generating some content over there we did a lot of uh, um, uh, campaigns in LinkedIn because it was very easy for us to identify the target audience based on the, uh, the skills I mean it's people who are our target audience initially at least were have had like very specific skills so the targeting in the LinkedIn campaigns was very uh, easy and this worked very well for us I'll explain about the rest of the uh, campaigns that worked for us uh, later on in the session. But basically, initially, we focused on content and uh, campaigns in LinkedIn, which uh, worked very well. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Romel Levin from Cloud Endure. What we do at Cloud Endure is we help companies who are running on the cloud when they have downtime, downtime and we allow them within two minutes to uh, spin up or build uh, their whole application and latest data in a different region. And it turns out that about half of the companies have downtime within their applications every quarter, more or less. So that's what we do. We basically sell some sort of an insurance policy for not having downtime if you're running on the cloud. In terms of uh, lead generation, uh, we launched three months ago. Um, so far, we generated a few thousand leads. I can tell you that most of them, surprisingly, uh, which is not different from my experience in previous companies, came from conferences. Actually, we went to just one conference, but it was a very big success. Um, the rest are coming. They're kind of split between uh, PPC and social media, um, organic, uh, paper lead, a lot of different options. We're basically kind of shooting everywhere to see what works best to convert into qualified leads, and that's where we're going to continue and invest our money. OK, so just to have everyone on the same page, OK? How many of you using, uh, are using uh, events, you said conferences, right, uh, in order to uh, generate leads? OK. How many of you are, you know what, let's, let's extend to everybody here in the room, OK? How many of you are using events to generate quality leads? Awesome. How many of you are using email marketing in order to do that? Okay. How many of you are using social for that? Okay. Paid in Google? Remarketing, retargeting? Well, you know, if that was true, we didn't have any work to do, you know? <laughs> Thankfully, you're wrong. Um, okay, so we have here... Um, and of course, you also do you buy do you buy lists of emails? What we do, and we actually, I think it's proving to be one of our most successful channels. We don't buy lists. Uh, my experience is that buying lists produces the worst quality. Uh, I've done actually a research when I was at Panaya. We worked with twenty different potential providers to test the quality of their lists. The highest, most expensive quality were s still wasn't good enough. Um, you share numbers? Um, share numbers. Oh, of when you're saying not good enough, what is it? What um, the yeah, for example, we worked with a company that turned out to be from India, and they were the, the highest quality for least list purchasing. And um, I don't remember exactly how much we paid them, but I can tell you in terms of the quality that 50 percent of the leads, and that was the highest quality, um, were not valid, either no longer in the company, wrong email. The one source, if you're targeting IT people, there is one, there's a few similar to it, but the best one that I did find, and it's very high quality, there's a tool called Discover Org, um, and uh, they're mostly um, for IT. They mapped up uh, more or less all the companies in the States that have a revenue of, I think, I think $100 million in North, which is for a lot of us the, the target market. And for those companies, they have the whole structure of the company, at least within the IT department. And their quality is very, very high. And it's also a relatively expensive service. 
So, you know, uh, five years ago, if we'd ask who is buying lists, uh, more hands were, were in there, right? Um, okay. And do you guys use all the content marketing? I call it just marketing, right? But content marketing uh, tools, do, do you guys do webinars? Yeah? How many years doing webinar in their company? Okay. And how many of you are thinking that the investment you're putting into webinars, for example, is worth the effort and the money? Okay, it's pretty much the same hands, which is, which is good. Uh, white papers? Okay. How many of you are tracking the, um, the support for leads of uh, ungated content? Meaning blog posts, lead scoring based on blog post content and stuff like that. Well, you, you probably, you know, somewhat. <laughs> okay. So we understand how that almost everybody here in the room are facing the same, cha the, the, the same reality, You're using multiple channels to bring in leads, okay? Um, which, for each one of you, which one was the best channel that you're saying, you know, if there is one takeaway from this event besides the free beer, you have to use this specific channel? Well, I, I actually don't think uh, I'm, I'm working in, in such a thing, because we tested a lot of channels till we find what was working for us, and it was beca because of the time people have to read our uh, landing pages. Actually, we have, and maybe this is a good takeaway, but uh, we, we found that longer landing pages worked better for us. Like instead of just like sign up and, and here's a photo, we've made a landing page that looks like a post, like something you'd have in a white paper. So people went in, they read it, they spent like uh, for several of our landing pages seven minutes reading it and then they sign up and then they convert much better and we have uh, and you said about email marketing we use a, a tool called intercom io so it's like uh, it's a light uh, uh, it just uh, does segmentation and emailing uh, 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 to users and we're sending a, a our sign up email is just like hi thanks for using uh, signing up what do you want the product to do for you and what we found is that people echo what they read in the landing page, which is great because <laughs> we managed to, to get, get it into them like exactly how we wanted it. So, so it, it directs them into expecting something and that's, I think, really good. Okay, so for, uh, for us initially, LinkedIn was the, uh, the top source. I mean, both uh, campaigns in LinkedIn and also uh, providing answers in relevant uh, discussion groups. And uh, afterwards, like we, uh, LinkedIn at some point, we got to a point where like we used the community was, the target audience was not high, large enough. So we t turned to start using Google and Google is also doing a, v a very good job. And we're also using Twitter, but uh, results over there are not uh, as good as uh, uh, LinkedIn and Google. Um. For us, uh, we had a surprising, I think, f at least to me, a channel that uh, turns out to be working the best. And it's kind of a list, but not one that you buy, one that you build. And um, I'll tell you what we did. It's, it's a bit of a long explanation. I'll try to do it in less than two minutes. Um, so we help companies who have downtime. What we did is we built a list of all the websites that are running on the cloud. You can get that information, for example, from Built With. I think for a lot of you, you can get your target audience from Built With. So we had all these uh, websites, it's about 150,000 websites, and we started building with our own R&D a, a tool that tracks all those websites to see if they have downtime. And we tracked it for a few months, and then we got a list of all the sites that had downtime and those that didn't have downtime. Then the next step is we only had those websites, then you need to find the people you want to tell them if they had or didn't have downtime. So then we use a, a service from Odesk, which means basically you're working with people from India and Pakistan who are very, very proficient at finding the people, including a 100% valid email. Okay, they know how to do it. And then we b built a campaign to target those people. Half of them had downtime, half of them didn't. And I can share with you that the email we sent them, which was basically um, the company name, and we'll tell you if you had downtime in Q1 2014, we had an open rate uh, on that email of 60%. Okay, I've never seen anything like it. And it took us months to build it. 
Okay, so whatever you're doing, if you can build that kind of list, I think it's it's it could be a gold mine. We had a customer of ours who do a one-hour translations. They do translations of uh, different material. So my suggestion was in the same manner to find out all the websites who have only pages in English. You can build that with R and D. Check with some sort of tools like Alexa if they're getting more than let's say five percent of the traffic from Germany, and then you can send them a dedicated email. Hey, 5% of your traffic is from Germany, and we can translate it for you. Okay, that's probably, for us, the best channel we have. Just to put things in perspective, this is, like, awesome. Um, <laughs> we're, we're using Built With as well to do a lot of the things. Uh, it's mainly as uh, Built With. It's, uh, it's basically a tool that enables you to know what kind of code is running on a website. Um, it's like? like similar similar. Sites, similar it's like, yeah, in a sense, it's like similar sites. It's very, it's, it has a lot of very good features and very, the free edition is for a lot of the things, all that you need. They're, they've also this kind of a very cool plugin to Chrome that we are using. So when I'm going, if any of you got an email from me saying, hey, dude, you're not using marketing automation, we should talk. It's because what we do is we are going to the website and then we see if there is a code there of marketing automation platform. And then we know that the company is not utilizing it, like one of the companies that I'm looking at right now that are not using marketing automation. And then I t know to tell them, look, we should probably talk because you're not using marketing automation while you're selling to B2B and you probably need that as a, as a tool in order to, uh, uh, to improve your conversion rate. And we can talk about it later, but it's just an example. Yeah. I got a voicemail over the weekend from HubSpot, and it started by, hey, I noticed you're using Marketo, and he, he had kind of a, a line of why we should consider HubSpot. Yeah. So this is, it's valuable information. Yeah, it's, it's, it works really well. But I have a question here for everybody here are marketers. Not all of them have the luxury that I think three of you have, that you, have, you can tap um, development resources for your marketing needs. How many people here that are in marketing position cannot get an hour of developer even if their life depends on that. All of you can do that. This is awesome. Okay. We are like Care Bear area here. It's awesome. Okay. I can tell that uh, what we see with most of our, uh, our clients, it's very challenging, especially in larger companies. Uh, companies in the telecom business is a great example, which is really hard to tap on marketing resources, uh, get marketing resources from, from development, and so on. Okay, so because as, as people here explained, they have tons of leads, they get them in a very good price, right? It's like the A team of lead gen, okay? No, besides me, okay? This is like, okay? So it's the A team of lead gen. Here comes the, the, the big question. Leads, you can get in gazillion ways. Most of them, at least, in longer sales cycles, I think you are the exception. We'll discuss your point in a second. But in most cases, leads that leave their, uh, their details on a website, especially when you're talking about content marketing, especially when you're doing a webinar, when you're doing an event, when you're doing, you have a white paper that is useful, they are not sales ready, right? How many people here think that lead nurturing is a challenge for them today? Okay. It's a, huge, it's a huge challenge. And what I would like to hear from you guys is, first of all, how do you quantify it? How do you know where to put your next dollar, in lead gen or lead nurturing? OK, so actually, I'll, I'll let Ramel answer first, because he formulated this question, so he probably have the best answer. <laughs> um, so I don't remember exactly the numbers, but there is research for B2B marketers that show that, um, excuse me? You don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, that uh, most of the, it's over 90% of the dollars that marketers put into marketing goes to lead, ac lead acquisition. And because of over, depends where you look, but over, let's say, 75 to 90% of the leads are not lead ready and you're still getting them, it, it would be a real waste not to, to invest money to try and get, to find from those leads who are the leads that are ready. So, um, I think that investing in marketing automation, it's kind of a long-term effort. And we, we think that, uh, you know, with Clicktail, my previous company, I can tell you that about 75% of the leads were definitely not sales ready. About 20 to 25, which is a high number, were sales ready. It still can take half a year to sell to them. 
but they're passable or marketing qualified leads that you can pass to sales. So you have to work with those 75% of the leads. And the way I see it is you have to take into account that it can take up to two years to find the good ones within those 75% of the leads. And it's probably, by the way, only a third of them. Only a third of those 75%, which is still a lot, it's 25% of your overall leads, they will qualify, they will purchase a product, but not necessarily from you. If you do nurture them and you're gonna be patient, they will qualify. Okay, so in general, I mean, I agree with what Ramel said, but uh, what we're seeing is like, uh, the, like for the 80% who are not sales ready, it, it takes time and not all, I mean, in some cases, we just launched the product like six months ago, so I'm not sure I have like the uh, full statistics yet, but what we're starting to see is we're starting to see some leads who signed up like back in January or February and we're like, all of a sudden they see a webinar and they start joining a webinar and then after, after the webinar, they send us an email, okay, this sounds very interesting, I would like to have a call and see a demo, I would like to uh, see the pricing so uh, the, the content is, is t doing an effect I mean either a webinar or sometimes even updates about the uh, new features in the product I mean some companies did not use our product just because they were using a, a development language that was not supported by our uh, solutions or as we're adding new languages we're sending these uh, announcements either in the social channels or uh, or just in direct emails so we're starting to see more and more uh, leads coming in but it, it's it's a long process and um, I'm, I don't have like the full statistics yet but uh, what, what we're seeing that works very good in, in uh, like waking up those uh, sleepy leads is mainly webinars and sometimes like very uh, technical content uh, about a topic that they find interesting or uh, which is there is a hype around this is the kind of thing which uh, which works in this area um, one more thing that I want to add about marketing automation, uh, from an experience of doing it in three different companies, what I've learned is that in the first company I built a crazy, crazy marketing automation machine with a lot of the segmentations and, and tracks, um, and it became a monster. And I can tell you that after doing it two more times, the most important thing in marketing automation from my experience is to simply remind people that you exist. It, of course, you have to send them interesting information and you have to see what's most the most engaging. But send them an email every two weeks or so and you have to test what's the right time. That's the most important thing. So when it does become relevant, they'll say, oh, yeah, I'll send a, I'll ask a, for a quote or for a demo from, from those companies who sent me an email last week or last whenever. I will just would like to touch on that from our experience also and also from the experience of some of our clients. I think the biggest challenge that marketers face today that if five to ten years ago you could think in a mode of campaigns, I'm doing a campaign, I'm bumping up my numbers and then I'm waiting for the next campaign. Now the model is continuous engagement. You constantly have to touch your database. That's extremely hard because some of it the definition of a database is very, very fluid. In the past it was emails, now it includes also social. And you need somehow to manage it, you need somehow to track it. You need to create tons of ton content to constantly do that. And you need to always find a way to be very, very interesting because nobody wants to get junk. The worst thing you can do is send an email that is not interesting because the person will just unsubscribe or just flag you as spam that will hurt you in even a bigger way with the ISPs and so on. So you constantly have to do to be very, very uh, very, very smart and provide a lot of value. One of the companies doing a good job about it, by the way, is Octopus that are here. Blur, raise your hand, guys. What these guys found is an, an awesome way to hack the process. Because creating content is so expensive, they're doing something called customer webinars, which basically they're calling their customers to talk about their experience on specific things. And they balance the effort of they're bringing in a lot of value because they're bringing smart people to speak there, and they're also able to provide a lot of value to their database. And that's a good, that's a good example. Um, there are other companies doing a lot of very, very good things with that, but if you, you know, at least my, my, uh, my advice, if you need to think about a model in your mind on how to build this kind of operation, continuous engagement. You cannot create demand. There is this term demand generation. 95% of the cases of not in your case. In your case, it's a bit no, no, different, no, I, I, I think. I, I think uh, you, we're, we're on the same, 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 same line. Yeah. So in 95% of the cases, companies cannot create demand. They can just be there and wait for customers when they decide that they really want a solution to the problem that the company solves to think about this specific company as a solution. We see it when we're selling our services. We see it when we're helping our clients sell their services. Uh, and we also see it with the companies that we are buying their products, right? We are using a lot of technologies as well. I, I would just add that uh, email is still like 
whoever I, I talk, like Facebook, if you talk to the guys marketing at Facebook, they say the best way for them to yeah. create retention is email. So, so, uh, uh, so, so email is like the social is, is nice. We're, we're getting all our leads from social, but like emails are, are uh, killer. And what we do is refunnel them. Mm -hmm. Like we, we give them like uh, every time the trial ends, like nine days later, you can reset your trial. So if you want to use the polls for free, every 30 days have a nine day pause, that's fine. That's a free account, but but we ref we we enter them we enter them into the funnel, and sometimes they're ready for a project to a new project, and they want to use us or or something like that, and they really need to be kept uh, aware that we're there, and it's the same thing, and and I think it's more acute. Like I would say that like after a week from sign up, even though it hasn't expired, they forget who we are sometimes. So really, because you sign up, like how many uh, apps do you sign up in a web a day? Tons. Like a couple of them a day in my case. So, so we're actually starting to, to remind them, like in the first week. And we're now working in, uh, on, uh, and I think uh, um, I heard uh, Mad Mimi does it really well. And I love that's like a, an email tip. I really love we're doing it. And, and it's nice that they send on the first eight days, like Mad Mimi is a competitor to MailChimp and it lets you create a newsletter and they assume that if you sign up or want Mad Mimi, you want to create an awesome newsletter. So they start by saying, uh, we're going to give you an eight day uh, training on how to build the best newsletter. And they send you eight emails, one day at a, a, like each day after sign up. And because it's you know it's like one of eight. You say like you won't market it spam or delete because you say, oh, this is not interesting, but tomorrow one may be interesting. Uh, so, so that's like really cool. I, I think uh, it's, it's a nice idea. And another thing that we've tested, we're doing a lot of email testing, uh, A-B testing and stuff. So uh, what Joel here tested uh, with part of the, the post team, that uh, to send the same email as plain or as a company format. Yeah. Right, so what we found is if we send the same email uh, 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 in a plain format or with the company format, what happens is that the plain email gets more responses but more unsubscribes because you, you read like, oh, this guy's bothering me, I'm going to uh, mark it as spam or unsubscribe because it's a personal approach. But if it's a company email, uh, people see, oh, a company format, I, I won't take the time to respond so much, but they unsubscribe much less because they say, okay, I like the company, just like this email is not interesting to me, so so maybe tomorrow it'll be better. That's like what we understand out of it. But it's like uh, uh, the opposite of, of engagement and yeah. uh, unsubscription. So we started changing all our emails to fit one or the other what it what it's supposed to do. I know it's like a question for it. What we've done uh, about email marketing, because that's uh, that's a good point. We've decided to go plain text, all the emails. Uh, we've built a database bottom up. And when you do it this way, I think that plain text works better. If, if you had already engagement with a person, if you met them in a conference, or they signed to a webinar, or something like that, and they already have a, a person that is there, he's the face of the company for them, then they don't want to be, uh, at least this is my assumption from the we're data. We're not sending enough emails. Like, we're sending so many emails. No, no, I'm, I'm saying that's, uh -huh. yeah, this is for more of a boutique, you know, I have a very, our database is, uh, is not that large, but it's very, 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 very targeted. Our, our approach, because we're a small company, we cannot have, I do not have anything to do with 1,000 leads. If I have 1,000 leads per month, we will, you know, Roy is here, where is, uh, where is Roy? Roy is here. Roy is uh, uh, going through all the incoming leads and he's starting to, you know, figure out what should we do with them. He will die, okay? We don't want him to die. He's a nice guy. So we do not do that. Um, but then we do all those very personal approaches with very specific points there that lead people to, to high quality content. And we found that it pro for us, it, open, it uh, gives us data of around 50 to 60% again of, of opening rate. Um, if you're doing something which is wider, then it's a bit different. And here, I have to say that it always takes me like two seconds to figure out that this is an automated email. The email I get from you. It takes me like a second to... Which oh, wait, wait a minute. It's automated. <laughs> it's not for me. 
By the way, my CEO was commenting on your email that he said, oh, it looks really, really personal. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the fear is doing a great I job with that. I haven't talked to him a while. Okay. <laughs> I just want to share one more tip because I'm assuming everyone here is doing marketing automation. And most of the companies who send emails in marketing automations, it looks like a standalone email that you send once, let's say, every other week, which is fine. A way to overcome kind of the noise within marketing automation is to create a sense of, a, of having the email being personal. So one way is the copy, which is very important. Another way is to create mini campaigns in the in the marketing automation that look looks like it's a follow-up email so let's say you're inviting someone to a webinar so the first email you write personal hey i'd like to invite you hey john i'd like to invite you to the webinar and then if he doesn't re register to the webinar you send him an email which includes the previous email like like you replied or forwarded that email and you say hey john I, ha I noticed you haven't registered yet. And we've seen that this works so well, people don't see that it's uh, it's coming from marketing automation. They Sometimes they actually apologize for not responding to the first email. Another trick that you can do, let's say you want to run a special promotion, okay? So a trick that you can do is you can, um, you can be, let's say you're sending the email on behalf of the sales guy. So you can do, um, you can make the email look like it's being forwarded. Uh, sorry, let's. You make it look like there was an email sent to your sales guy uh, from the VP of Sales saying, "Hey, uh, Kevin, um, we have a special promotion that you can give to one customer." Okay, and then it looks like Kevin is that he's the sales guy that he's forwarding it to your to the customer and saying, "Hey, John, I have this one slot for my best customer, and I want to give it to you." Now it's all automated. And people simply fall for it. Okay, it's a little bit dirty, and it works. It's okay, it's not dirty. It's failing. It's marketing. So there were two questions. What is the ratio between your um, marketing budget uh, and your overall company budget? Right? Am I right? And what was uh, the ratio between nurturing versus lead gen? No. Actually, for nurturing leads, like how many success managers or account managers do you know, need per? Uh, how many success managers do you need per success well nurtured lead? Like yeah, I just invented a new marketing term, well nurtured lead. Okay, so uh, regarding the marketing budget, um, I don't know if it, it fits everyone's model, but our model, the low touch one, uh, is uh, we we see the return on the invest on, on paying customer like it costs us about uh, four hundred to five hundred dollars to get a paying customer, and they uh, are on average paying a uh, hundred dollars a month. So we get the money back after five months, and last month we've, for example, uh, released the yearly. Uh, option and we got like crazy, uh, uh, like 50% by yearly, which is crazy. So what that does is cr reduce the TROI, the time that you ROI that investment. So if it's like two months, then whatever the marketing budget you have, you can reinvest it like after two months. If it's like half a year, you can. So the marketing budget is not exactly, it's not like the rest of the money, like you throw it back in and you see it, a lot of companies do, do that. So, so it depends on your TRY essentially. Uh, so it depends, that's the answer. And, uh, and what was the second question? <laughs> How many success managers do you need per uh, nurtured lead? So actually we're, successfully we're nurtured yeah, so, so actually we're seeing now that we, we contact uh, leads that, uh, that use the product currently and paid for it as well. Like that's the lead nurturing we have. We see that you managed to use the software. So. I would say that we are well behind the uh, amount of people that we need to to because we need to call others that just want to, and that's what we want. So so we see we're behind. So I would say that currently what I what I'm looking at is like seeing the amount of leads that you have that are, you think can convert and you know that can convert that you don't get to uh, in a timely fashion. That's like uh, what we're doing now is is increasing the the customer success sales team until they reach that point. So, so it's like, what about 1 to 10, 20, 1 to 100? So, no, it's, that depends on the product. Uh, like, we're doing a, a fight between marketing and sales. Uh, with, our, uh, like, uh, with paid marketing, we're, we're telling them, like, the marketing guy, you need to buy enough 
to get enough leads so the sales team will not be able to handle them and we tell the sales guy <laughs> like hire more people to give a fight to the marketing <laughs> team so but it d depends on the product it's, it's called uh, it's called the gladiator mode they throw them into a ring and see who wins okay so we pay something like twenty dollars per uh, uh, per lead and the cost per customer is something like four hundred dollars uh, and the pay customer is paying something like uh, eighty dollars per month or one thousand dollars per uh, per year and um, re regarding the other question with the uh, customer success uh, uh, manager so we're a small company we just uh, we launched recently and we're like uh, relatively a small team we just uh, finished fundraising uh, round so we basically have like one and a half customer success engineer we're sending something like 1500 uh, leads and we i mean we mostly do the nurturing based on uh, like engagement with uh, uh, content that we generate and also the like the top uh, channel is based on usage of the product so we start seeing people starting to use the product based on the uh, backend statistics of our product, like people creating uh, uh, tests, people uh, um, having failed tests or having issues with the test. So that that's a good way to uh, to create engagement. And the the other thing is based on like uh, attendees of webinars and the people who are uh, showing interest in, in content. So this is where the customer success sales managers are, uh, are focusing. So uh, regarding the first question about uh, the ratio between marketing budget and overall company budget, so uh, we're within what I've seen that is the range of uh, B2B companies, which is 5 to 20% of the overall budget. It's a big difference. Uh, if you're less than 5, you should be worried. Also, probably if you're over 20. Um, Regarding the customer success managers, so at Cloud Endure, we don't have yet any customer success manager we just launched, but I can tell you that I think it's, it, it mostly depends on the usage of the product. So I can tell you at Clicktail, we had five at the time, five enterprise sales manager and five uh, customer success managers. At Panaya, we had 50 sales managers and we had a team of less than five people who were customer success managers. So I think it's mostly about the frequency and complexity of the product and not, I don't see it anything, that it has anything to do with the amount of leads that you're nurturing. So the more complex you the more, like, more success managers. The more complex, we need more success managers. Yes. Additional questions? We will do around Robin and then, okay? Yeah. Do you have any? Can I, I will, I, I want to challenge the, or introduce the, the challenge I'm facing. So maybe the smart people here will be able to help me. So instead of going into our product. Can you, could you first uh, present yourself? Yes, my name is Netta, I'm VP of Marketing for White Source. White Source does um, open source man uh, management of op open source components. So it's something you sh that most organizations today do on a spreadsheet, the same way they used to do uh, backtracking on spreadsheet. But now nobody does backtracking using a uh, spreadsheet. If there were more R&D people here, you'd say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we, yeah. we want to get people to, to use our solution because it, it offers quite a few Advantages over spreadsheet. So just uh, just repeat it for the video. Uh, so Netta from White Source, right? That helps companies, developers. You're selling to developers. Yeah. Okay. Okay. VPs are indeed are. Who else here in the room sells to developers? The target audience are developers. Okay. Um, so because it's important for you to, you know, you'll be able to talk with them later. But so, and your product enables you, uh, enables VP of r to track the usage of open source components in their products. Right, okay. and do it, do it efficiently, do it continuously, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, so instead of talking about open source, I'm going to give an example that everybody can relate to, which is suppose that we're, you're a B2B, but let's, in a B2B realm, let's talk about someone who's selling wedding dresses, okay? So he has a database of like, 30,000 women in the right ages and he wants to sell, he's sending them emails every week or every month with, in his mind he wants, when the day comes, he wants to be on their mind when they have to choose the wedding dress. So there is, what I'm saying is that there is an event that you can't find about, okay, that's usually kept under wraps, that triggers the, or, or, or ripens the, the lead. So I, I, this is what's called. You can't figure oh. out. Right? Oh yeah, that's what's called a compelling event. There is so there is a compelling event that drives companies to buy 
a specific product. And in your case, there has to be some kind of a compelling event. There is a, right, right. It, it, my dream is that every woman will start wearing a, a wedding dress every day. But right now, I'm looking for the compelling event that mm -hmm. actually uh, triggers an, a, a great necessity for my solution. And this compelling event, unfortunately, does not show itself anywhere. Okay. It's no, usually a secretive event. You know so so we, have, we have a compelling event. Just first of all, let's just uh, get everybody in the, on the same page. We have a compelling event. This compelling event doesn't have a signature outside of the company. It's usually kept under wraps, so... Okay. What is it? An M&A event or... Uh, Okay, an M&A event that they need to clear IP rights before they do that. Okay, so your challenge is you have the database, but now how you have a huge database, and now your challenge is how do you? I'm looking for an idea to okay, I can keep sending stuff to tens of thousands of people all the time. I'm looking for a way to do it in, in a, a smart in a way. Smart of way. Doing it. I don't know. Maybe there isn't one, but okay. So the so the marketing challenge is as follows. We have a compelling event. This compelling event doesn't have any signature outside of the company. Your product, what, how much does it cost? It's not expensive. Not expensive is always something which is compared to something else. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's affordable to most uh, medium to large companies. Not, it's, not a big, it's not a big. But is it a complex sale? Is it a complex sale? Is it a simple sale? I mean, you have to talk with multiple people in the organization to sell the product or just one person. You know, the VP R&D can take out his, his, his corporate credit card and... Depends on the company. He can, he usually can. Okay. So, first of all, is there any other person here in the room that faces the same challenge? There is a compelling event that they cannot recognize externally. Not only they, they cannot recognize it, it's even something that there is an interest to, to, to uh, keep it under the secret. I think it's close to what you guys are doing, in a sense. Nobody wants to say, I have a downtime. You are able to identify it because you know how to track it um, technically. We have, uh, it's not the same because we have a kind of a compelling event to show their interest is when they have downtime. So when they have downtime, we can send them an email because we have the monitoring tool. Say, hey, by the way, you know, we don't want to be yeah. the big brother. Okay, so we can send it at the end of the quarter. Hey, we've noticed you had downtime, so we're creating the compelling event for them. And um, the case you're describing is indeed it sounds a little bit hard. Uh, yeah, so you're not creating a compelling event. No, no we're not you're creating, but really we're monitor. We're you, monit found way, you found a way to identify the compelling event. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I think the, the ways I've seen companies hand finding the compelling events, it's, it's one, or, one or two. Either there is an event you can identify. I mean, if it was the wedding dress, it's relatively easy. See that someone joins uh, Facebook for whatever wedding something, and you can target them. Um, at Panaya, for example, uh, we were selling to companies who are doing an upgrade to SAP, SAP that happens once, more, more or less, let's say, every two years. So what we did is we had people, our inside sales, they would call them. Okay, those, those prospects, and they would ask them, hey, by the way, when is your next upgrade? And they would say, you know what, it's next year. And they would write an event to follow up in a year. And until then, we, we keep sending them information, which is interesting in general. And then we follow up in time to see if, if the compelling event happened. Okay, so... <laughs> So, uh, I mean, I, I think f for us it's also uh, a challenge to find a compelling event because sometimes the compelling event could be like a, a bug in a major release that uh, the customer did. So we did try to search for uh, for these events and send uh, companies, but we heard from companies like Staples where they had like their Christmas sales and they all of a sudden some of the, the websites are broke down on some devices or like the uh, pay now button was uh, hidden or stuff like that. So th these were the sorts of compelling events. But in, in your case, actually, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, other than hacking into the databases of very <laughs> VCs, uh, so. well, one of the things that um, one of the things that might work is maybe not try to target the companies themselves. So if you have a list of compelling events, and you're saying M and A, M and A, you have accountants, you have lawyers, you have, so maybe that's one of you know take the second tier. That's that's one thing that might work. I don't know how well it works, but that might work. The other thing is uh, frighten your database constantly tell them you know it's the worst thing ever you're all gonna die kind of thing and then when they will see impending doom coming they will that's the model of continuous engagement you're constantly talking with them and you're just waiting there for something to happen it's the same by with uh, with marketing marie here also 
probably will agree with me. The same with marketing automation. You you cannot get a client to buy marketing automation. You can just you know hopefully that he will come to you when they are talking about marketing, right? Yes. It's so a. I have the awareness that they don't. I see the meeting sometimes, and it's like I feel like I'm fighting too much. Or it's a hard sale. They have to get it. They have to budget on this. Yeah, they they have to come half half cook, you know. They just like say, yeah, we want, and then you and I need to arm wrestle a bit, and then we need to win, and then everything's okay. Um, <laughs> something that we use like con uh, conceptually, I don't know. I think it it's like uh, without a platform, but there is a time that you have uh, the attention of someone, like when they sign up or read something that you do, and then we try to do to think how to uh, create an inception. You saw the movie, right? Like, to, to, to get an idea, the what? Idea, you know, was it a dream, was it real? I, uh, but the concept is clear, right? like you plant something in, in the person's head that will mature when the time is comes. So, so uh, some things that we did, we said like uh, in the polls, things turn green and you celebrate the success of ac accomplishing something. And then they look around and they don't see it in any other software and it, it bugs them all the time that they don't see it or something like that. You need to be creative about what differentiates you and, and what you uh, like, not just like scaring them into, into uh, now buying it, but to have them uh, uh, think about it all the time, like something that they will loop around in their head, like, and, and you need to think about it like that, like what will, what will be something that they keep thinking of until the time is right and, and they need it. Uh, uh, it's not easy to do, but uh, I think yeah, you can try stuff and, and see. Okay. Just can you present yourself, Idan from JFrog? Yeah, my name is Idan from JFrog. So we're using the marketing automation as well. We are tagging our user, we're creating a profile. For example, we created content for specific segmentation. Then we know exactly, let's say we have also a very huge uh, mailing list. We segmented it uh, using for specific technologies, specific languages, specific needs. And then, first of all, we, when you send the email, we're just we're not sending a general email, we're doing a very segmented email, that's first of all. Second, of, second we mentioned before, we, we first are trying to gain the trust about this, this segment. So, if, for example, they're using a specific language like Java, or Ruby, or .NET, whatever, we're doing a, we're doing a webinar. We're we asking to go to a webinar, or maybe sending a white paper specific for their needs, that, that talks about their, their needs, about their pain. Pretty specific with the white paper, then we do a follow-up follow with the webinar, and usually we try to do a partnership with a different company or a customer that's specific involved with this technology. And then we, in, in a way, we send them a white paper, so, so we gave them some tips and good information that hopefully I've heard them. And then we're doing a webinar with the professionals, so we build them our reputation, and then we get the trust around it. So, and then later on, the third one will be about our products, about how we sold, what we talked in the webinar, what we talked in the white paper, and then that one is then we see like the three parts, the campaign, the email campaign, and eventually bring bring them. Are, are you doing it also? I will just repeat it for the video. So what we're saying is that you're using content and email marketing. You are segmenting your database in a very very structured way, so you know how to do a very high quality approach. And then based on that, you define what kind of content you will offer them next. And then based on their interest, you know how to push them down the funnel, basically, right? Based on that. Now, are you doing that also? And that's, that's an important feature of marketing automation. Do you do it also on ungated content? Yeah, but, but also, yeah, but also not only not before, before we get to that, we're also doing uh, segmented using Google, Google Analytics. Okay. And then we can also track how, how much time you spend on this. Okay, so you're using another element that usually does not exist in, in marketing automation platform, which is time on page per. Analytics, then we make it up, we make it up. We're also doing a. Very impressive. We're doing the marketing around this subject. Nice. So they're using Java, they also see some banners. Not, not very commercial because when they type to Java, the developers and they don't like advertisement. We do very, very like advertisement parallel to this same period of time. Usually, 40 days, you. you we have the same customer group. Yeah. Nice, nice. Very, very, very interesting. Right. 
Mark Lerner from Octopost. Yeah. Um, this is a question about marketing automation and nurturing leads and build already. Um, so we use marketing automation in Marketo. We have lead scoring. Now, when a lead gets to a certain page or goes to a page a certain amount of times, we get an alert and it should go to sales. And you said that Big Brother might be an issue. So that, that's my concern. How long do you wait? Do you, do you call a person when he's on your website if he's gone three or four times in the same day? Or do you wait an hour? Or how much, how much time do you wait? The question was the following. We have technology to enable us to track everything. How much time do you wait uh, when you see an interest in order not to be freakish? Less than seven minutes. <laughs> so what, what number is less than seven minutes? Um, we did an experiment uh, when I was at Panaya where we did the most big brotherish thing you can possibly do. Um, we were tracking specifically when people either opened our emails or visited our website, and we knew that they were not doing it from their mobile devices because we do it, we don't want to call someone on their mobile, and if they're reading an email or visiting our website on the mobile, they're probably not at their desk. Now, we were trying to solve the number one problem for inside sales, which is getting hold of the person. So we did exactly what you're asking, and we said, for only specific very hot titles that we were that the salespeople said they're trying to reach we send them an alert the minute uh, the person either again opened the email or visited the website on his desktop and then they would call him and we were a little bit hesitant about the response now of course we weren't telling them hey we noticed you opened our email and um, so did it kind of hey Hey, by the way, I, I'm just calling you, and, and the responses were very surprised, but polite. They would they would say like, "Oh, amazing! I'm just reading your white paper." So we were very careful about it, and it worked really, really well. So um, f feel free to be big brothery uh, about those leads, or try it at least. So f for us, what worked well is doing it based on usage of the product, because what we've seen, we're selling to developers, and in many cases, developers don't really like speaking to uh, salespeople, and even customer success engineers, sometimes it's not uh, uh, that appealing. So what we did is mainly based on usage, and we, whenever we see, we've seen people like having some failures in the test, or having any issues getting started, or things like that, or having some uh, uh, tests getting stuck, this is like the best uh, engagement uh, point, and so sometimes, like not, not immediately when they're doing it, because we, we don't want them to feel like we're looking at their data or uh, anything like that, but later on in the day, and uh, th that's usually getting like the, be the best response rate. One of the things that we saw that works well for us and works well for some of our clients is to be um, subtle. Now, there is, you know, being polite is always good. So what happens is that I know the graphs on here uh, behind you are saying, no, you have to call him seven minutes. I saw the graph. If you're not calling after seven minutes, you're lo losing 50% of the success rate, blah, blah, blah. That's true. Uh, but I also buy a lot of products and I use a lot of products online. And when I'm on a website and just fill in my details and I got a phone call from John Smith that sounds extremely Indian, I mean, I know he's not John Smith, so tell me who's, what is your real name. I know you're not calling from California, dude. It's 8 a.m. Israel time, okay? Either you need to quit your job or you're not calling from California because in Bangalore, it's something like 10 a.m., right? So these are things that, that um, ruin the trust that I have with a company. I'm, I, have no, you know, I have no problem buying from a person in a specific country that calls me with a specific name at a specific time. I have no problem doing that, okay? So You're not racist. I'm not racist, thank you. So, no, seriously, I mean, it's, it's, it creates this kind of a strange feeling that is, uh, that when you're buying an, uh, a product that is, uh, there are two types of products. There are products that are cheap and that can be replaced easily, then I don't care. I really don't care. But when it's a product that I'm going to base my business upon it, I really don't like it. So I think that that's the kind of, you know, think about it, it's, it's human interaction. That's the reason why simple emails are written from people and not written from uh, we are happy to announce, right? All those we are happy to announce emails, okay? Emails that are written from real people get better uh, opening rate and click through rate because people want to talk with other people. So the best, what I've seen that works, works for some of our clients and at least for us is 
to be very, very subtle. You know, if you think that, uh, think about uh, yourself and your target audience and say, you know what, if I just sign up for a product, I would really like to tell you, I would really like to get an email a day later after I had some time just, you know, to click on a couple of things and see how it works, you know, and get a bit more comfortable with it. And then I'll have very, very specific questions. And yes, the graph won't look that good, but I believe that at the end of the day, chances I will stay for a year or more are much higher because I have this very, very strong trust with the company that I'm working with. And I think that's a, that's a fine line. It's also um, um, a line that, is bit, that depends on culture. Every country and every culture has different, uh, being subtle in different culture means different things. In Israel, it just means by now, okay? In the US means let's talk for a while, okay? You know, it's, it's really different. But uh, I think it's important to remember that at the end of the day, all the tools that we are using, all the tactics we are using, just enable us to scale intimacy, the fake intimacy, right? To scale it in some, in some ways, if it's social, if it's marketing automation, and so on. But then they were talking with people. And that's something that uh, the very KPI-driven approach that we strongly believe in, but the very KPI-driven approach sometimes get a bit muddled. I uh, just that we're not doing enough Big Brother stuff. That's what I'm feeling. Yeah. yeah, we need to do more. And we have a Big Brother advocate here as well. Um, okay, the time is 8 p.m. Uh, before we go to the last round of questions, did I have to do that? I didn't prepare you for, which is the best uh, advice that you have um, for people here in the audience. <laughs> um, I, I will start, but still. Um, any qu other questions that you want to know? Yeah, yes. So I will start with him because you asked. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Me again. <laughs> yeah, about uh, marketing automation. So uh, uh, in B2B market, a lot of times you're you selling to the end user. Many, many times the end user, <laughs> the end user isn't the person who actually purchasing and buying. So when you're using a marketing automation, Marketo, or Akno, pardon. Uh, usually you're tracking the person actually came, came into your website and download the trial or look at your product. Then you're tracking this person. But in the end, this is not the person who actually come and buy. This is the person who come and close the, the funnel. So when you're looking at your leads and you're looking at your campaigns, and you're looking at, for specific things, say for example, Google PPC campaign, and so you look at many leads, many downloads, but your, your ROI is, has worked. Is, is about zero because, not because you didn't sell, you didn't make a campaign, but because it, it, this is it, those people who came from this campaign and downloaded the product are not the person who actually came and bought. So the fund doesn't close. And I, I found a solution for that, but it's a, it's, it's a manual of the world. And I want to ask you if you have developed or do you know in a way that you can automatically close the funnel in Solution. I'll just repeat the question for uh, uh, for the audience for the video. So we're talking about complex sale. We're talk we were trying to sell. We are, we're touching multiple people in the organization. One person responded to the campaign, but another person was the actual one that closed it. But I think, for at least from what we've seen, you can probably do it within Salesforce and get the reports from there. And I think then you get to go to Marie and pay her more money <laughs> than your period till now. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, so in general, what we recommend, we represent Acton, and we also work with some, some of our clients also work with Pardot, so what we recommend usually to do is to do this kind of stuff within Salesforce and not through marketing automation because you can manage uh, um, account and opportunities in a better way for Salesforce. Uh, there are other challenges with Salesforce, which is like Salesforce, but in general, you can do that specific things like tracking funnel and stuff like that. That's something that Salesforce has better tools to do it than most of the marketing automation tools out there. This is from our experience. Yeah, so same answer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, not the same answer. No, something else that I want to add. At the end of the day, your question when you do the ROI is you want to know if someone would tell you, listen, this specific account with lots of leads that you have in it, uh, you want to repeat it. Okay, and the question is, how do you repeat it? So I think that in many cases, that first contact, even though he wasn't the decision maker, it might make sense to try and bring in more people like him, and he, again, will pull in the relevant decision maker um, into the account. The way we did it and the way we built it with ServiceWise, 
is that, and again, you can do a lot of complex attribution models. You can say the first contact has this amount of weight to the ROI. The last one has another significant amount. And those in the middle have something in the middle. And we wanted to do something to keep it simple. And what we did is we said that for at least 80% of the cases, the first contact is the most important one. So um, it doesn't matter if we have 20 uh, contact within the account, the source of the first contact is also what we consider the source of the account, and that's how we do the attribution and the calculation of the ROI. Again, it's just to keep things simple, and it's good enough for 80% of the cases. Um, there is also a blog post that we wrote specifically about that in our blog, uh, about multi-touch point versus first touch point and last touch point attribution of, uh, of revenues. Um, what we're also doing internally, we're, what we're doing, we're using campaigns in Salesforce as a tool to identify multi-touch points. Uh, we're using Octopus for social distribution. So whenever the first touch point comes from them, uh, we put the lead source as social, uh, which is pretty, I can't say bad words, you know, but it's really awesome. Um, and then and we have that, and then all the other activities that we do, we have, of course, it's because it's fully synced with Act, between Acton, which is our marketing automation tool, and Salesforce, everything works flawlessly, okay? Um, okay, so some of the people here like football, I don't know, soccer or something like that. Just, okay, but one last question because you didn't ask. Yes, um, what do you think about B2B marketing? Is it worthwhile as a career? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica Zimmet from Amdocs, social media in Amdocs. Um, you mentioned that you guys have support from developers uh, to do marketing or do marketing automation. I wanted to ask the audience just for a show of hands, who has the developer support again? Depends for what. What do you mean? Je Jessica asks, just to, to get together a clear understand, Jessica asks, because she works in Amdocs, they don't have a lot of developers. It's a very small company. And uh, so she wanted to know how many of you have, uh, let's say, concrete support from developers for specific. Let's put it this way. How many of you are, are able to allocate developer time for things that are concretely and specifically related to marketing. And let's start, just one thing, let's start from companies that do not sell products to developers, because I think there is a major difference between the two. So how many of you actually have development resources for marketing? Outsourcing. No outsource, in-house, in right? In-house, we're talking about in-house. Okay, only three. I'm the Four. <laughs> yeah, okay, but let's say, so most of you do not have developer resources on tap. And by the way, when I'm talking about development, I'm not talking about someone to set up a landing page or we're talking about hardcore development, like the example that Ramel said, I have a monitoring system that identifies whether well, a website is down. Most of our clients, some of our clients are coming from the uh, uh, high-end enterprise sales or telecom. Most of them do not have developer support. Most of them. And if they will have developer support, it won't help them because their guys know how to, you know, work on CRM databases, but they do not know how to do all the cool tricks that you need for marketing. So you just need the budget in order to work with external resources that can do that for you uh, to do more sophisticated things. Okay? Okay, so um, last question for the panelists. You have one and only one tip to give uh, the audience here. One tip with three parts? One tip that can be executed with one budget line <laughs> uh, that they need to implement tomorrow. Okay, in your opinion, that's like, you know, the golden rule, the thing of, if I knew that five years ago, you know, I would, would do a way better service to my company than what I've done in this period, okay? What will be your one tip? Um, I guess I'll call it B-Y-O-L, build your own lists. Um, going back to what I said at the beginning, find, pinpoint exactly who would be your uh, golden prospect and find whatever it takes to build that specific list and then start using external services like Odesk or, by the way, there are specific companies who specialize in this, like there's a company called, I think, Next Sales. They're a bit more expensive, but they can find then the contacts within those companies and then hit them with an interesting and highly relevant content. 
Okay, so what, what works very well for us is there is a tool called BuzzSumo. Kfir actually introduced me to this solution. And basically what it allows you to do is to find relevant discussions based on uh, keywords. So if you're selling, uh, I don't know, the test automation solutions, you can look for discussions around test automation, around Selenium, around the different tools. And on a daily basis, or on a weekly basis, you can look at the uh, hottest discussions with the most shares on each of the social channels. And this is a very useful uh, solution. We have like a student working for us who like on a, uh, twice a week identifies all the relevant discussions and he brings us like a list of the discussions we're using our customers to respond on some of these uh, questions or the uh, discussion topics and also sometimes our developers and this generates a very high quality uh, uh, traffic to the website and we're seeing that people are they're coming from these specific discussions are very uh, mature leads because like th this is like a very specific customer looking at a discussion about uh, like uh, I don't know a new uh, a new method in uh, automated testing, and then all of a sudden a customer is saying, hey, I'm using this tool and it does an awesome job and uh, you have to try it out. So people coming from this discussion, this is like a great source. What's the name of the tool? Buzz Sumo, B-U-Z-Z-S-U-M-O. And what's the name of the student? <laughs> <laughs> we will send links to all the tools that we've, uh, that we've mentioned today in the email after the event, okay? Um, well, my tip is that... Uh, uh, <laughs> is that um, we actually went to a lot of companies uh, that do sales and marketing automation to listen what they have to say. And what I found is that everyone thinks they have a winning formula because they do, but it's for their own product. So, and, and what eventually was right for us is not what was right for them. So I would say don't listen to like, specific things like call in the first five minutes or whatever and say like you have to do whatever someone else tells you works for them you need to uh, do things fast and, and find what works for you because it's different for every product I think I have to admit that I'm going to uh, abuse my power and give two tips <laughs> so the first tip and I well one and a half because I said already the first one but it's important for everyone to remember uh, is to, m to remember that everybody are human. We're talking about one-to-one -one communication at the end of the day. We are not sending an email to a list. There are specific people there that are used to be treated as people in a list. If you find a way to hack that experience, and I can tell you that we're investing so much time in thinking what will be the, the subject line of the email, what will be the first line, to make sure that if we said we haven't talked for a while, it won't be for someone that we just talked with yesterday because it will look stupid. And I hate to look stupid, okay? So we have to be very, very, just to doing this very, very uh, human approach to marketing works amazingly well. That's point number one. Point number two, and that's one of the things we see that a lot of our, uh, uh, of our clients are, are having a challenge with it, is to optimize each and every touch point. It's like, you know, it's like being religious on that aspect. Um, meaning, you have a blog, you need to have a way to capture leads from the blog. It's critical. The guys from Bright Info solve it, other companies solve it. You have to figure out the customer journey, the buyer's journey in each and every t touch point. They go to your uh, Facebook page, what do they see there? They go, maybe they are strange, they're using Google+, Plus. they're one of the two that are using it, they're not working for Google. You have to do that as well. You have to think about all those different touch points. It's extremely challenging. I can tell you that uh, when we're doing our own marketing, we're not necessarily doing the best job in the world while doing that, okay? But this mindset um, turns, takes all the hidden potential in your current marketing organization, in your current inbound traffic, in your current email database, and makes it flourish. And it, it, it has an amazing effect. Um, I would like to thank you all. It was awesome. The bar is open, meaning that you can still, you don't have to leave, <laughs> okay, after we finish. Uh, feel free to network, uh, meet each other. We're gonna send an email after the event, a couple of days later, with all the links uh, from specific products that were uh, mentioned and specific tips. And hopefully, as we say in Hebrew, in a couple of weeks, we'll have the video, the unedited video at least, uh, online, so we'll be able to view it, and then we'll try to make shorter and more easy to consume. Thank you very much for coming, guys.